Hello, everyone. Today, we are going to talk about this chapter titled The Fight Between Leopards, written by Jim Corbett. An interesting account of a fight, a terrible fight between two leopards, written by this well known hunter conservationist. So let us begin by talking a little bit about Jim Corbett. Colonel Edward James Corbett was an Indian born British hunter, tracker, naturalist and author who hunted several man-eating tigers and leopards in the Garhwal and Kumaon regions of the Indian subcontinent while he was a colonel in the British Indian Army. So Garhwal, Kumaon, these are places in Uttarakhand. Though he was a hunter, he was well known as a conservationist. Why? He believed that we must conserve species of animals and must not hunt them without any reason. Must not hunt them for making profit. He only hunted leopards when the leopards were reported to be attacking human villages and killing human beings. Okay, so he was a conservationist who turned into an author after his retirement from service. His writings depict his experiences while tracking and hunting man-eating leopards in the Himalayas. So it is interesting to note that sometimes, you know, when he would be tracking leopards, he would find a wounded leopard. I mean, even if he would find a dead leopard, there would be wounds somewhere in the body of the leopard, which would tell him that actually the leopard did not turn into a man-eater out of his own accord. Probably he turned into a man-eater who attacked human beings because human beings attacked him first, injured him first. Okay, so all these are important points which... Uh, Jim Corbett wrote about while he described his hunting experiences. Okay. Now, Jim Corbett National Park in Nainital. You must have heard of this national park. This was the first national park to come under the Project Tiger Initiative, the one which has been started in India with the intention of saving tigers. So Jim Corbett National Park was named after this famous hunter. So he has written many books uh, like The Man-Eaters of Kumaon and the one that you see on screen, The Man-Eating Leopard of Rudra Prayag. Rudra Prayag is also sitting in Uttarakhand. Okay. So the chapter that we are going to talk about is an extract from this book, The Man-Eating Leopard of Rudra Praya. Okay, so now let us go to the chapter. But before that, it would be uh, helpful if we know something about the manner in which leopards live and, uh, you know, go for a kill. Okay. So leopards are nocturnal hunters. That means they hunt at night. Usually they hunt at night. Leopards are skilled climbers. They can climb trees. They can climb walls. Okay. And they like to rest in the branches of trees. Also, these strong beasts can carry their heavy prey up into the trees so that other animals don't bother. Okay, so they can climb trees. They can also carry their prey, their, their kill, okay, up to the tree. Leopards have their territory and this is the most important thing about them. 
They leave scratches on trees, urine, scent marks, and excrement to warn other leopards. Okay, so they create their territory, they mark their territory, and then uh, they don't allow other leopards to get into their territory. And if somehow a particular leopard crosses into another leopard's territory, then a fight breaks out. Okay. The present essay gives a detailed account of an accidental fight that broke out between a local leopard and the notorious man-eating leopard that had terrorized the hills of Rudra Prayag for eight years. Which of the two leopards wins the battle? Let's find out. Okay. So the writer, the essay, whatever we want to call it, it begins with Jim Corbett approaching a village named Bhanswara in Uttarakhand. Okay. Corbett visited Bhanswara because word had been sent to him about a fatal leopard attack in that village. So a leopard had come to that village and attacked someone and killed the victim. Okay. Now, when he neared the village, he heard the wailing of the woman who was mourning the victim of the attack. When he reached the village and met the woman, he wanted to spare her the task of reciting the painful events that led to her son's death. So from this, we come to know that the leopard had killed the woman's son and that is why she was mourning the death of her son. Now, Jim Corbett did not want to bother the woman and that is why he did not ask the woman to narrate whatever had happened. He wanted to uh, spare her this trauma, trauma of going over the whole thing again. But she was interested in narrating whatever had happened to the hunter. The woman was intent to share with him her version of the story. According to her, her son could have been saved had the villagers been courageous enough to run after the leopard and rescue the boy from the clutches of the beast. The woman was a widow and thought that her husband would have done so had he been alive. So she was very angry with the villagers because no villager tried to stop the priest and tried to save her son from the clutches of the beast. So she complained against the cowardice of the villagers. But Jim Corbett had something else to say to her. He was not used to handling people grieving hysterically. So he was a hunter and, you know, planning to trap a leopard or tracking a leopard or uh, going after uh, a leopard or looking for a dead leopard. These were uh, the tasks he was habituated with. But, you know, consoling people who have lost near and dear ones to leopard attacks that he was not comfortable with. Okay. So he was not used to handling people grieving hysterically. So this woman was grieving hysterically. Grieve means mourn the loss of uh, a dead, uh, dead person who is near and dear to uh, you. Okay. Hysterically with uncontrolled emotion. All right. So though the woman was wailing and crying loudly and grieving hysterically, he thought it was his duty to tell the woman that her grievance was unjust. Her complaint against the villagers was unjust. He explained to her that her son's death was immediate. When the leopard clutched the boy's throat, the force probably dislocated the head from the neck. So the leopard immediately clutched the throat of the boy and that force, okay, that force of the grass, it dislocated the head. So the boy was dead. 
before his body was dragged by the leper across the courtyard. So there was no chance for any villager to save the boy. Okay. Then, what aspect of the incident did the author find it difficult to conceive? Here, conceive means understand. So, what did he find difficult to understand? No, something related to this incident. The author found it difficult to understand how an animal the size of a leopard could cross the courtyard in daylight without attracting the attention of people or street dogs. So it is important to note that though usually leopards hunt at night, this particular attack happened in broad daylight. And, you know, people were uh, busy doing their work and uh, the village was active. And at that time, this particular leopard, it came into that courtyard, grabbed the boy, killed the boy, and then dragged the dead body of the boy uh, over a long distance. So Jim Corbett was really surprised how no villager could notice the presence of the leopard and even street dogs did not bark. Okay, he was really clueless about this thing. Then, the next part of uh, the essay tells us about the leopard's trail. So when the leopard uh, had caught uh, the boy, killed the boy, uh, then he had to take his kill to another place so that he could eat it. So what was the trail? Trail means the path that the leopard followed carrying the dead body of the boy. So the leopard first crossed an eight foot wall. Okay. Then there was a yam field. After crossing that uh, wall, he had to cross his yam field. Okay. Then again, he came to another wall, which was 12 feet tall. Okay. Then he crossed that. And then there was another field. And at the far end of that particular field was a rose hedge. Okay. A hedge with, uh, you know, rambler roses. Okay. And this hedge was four feet high. Then. The leopard's trail continues. It does not stop here. After crossing the four-foot rose hedge, there was a 10-foot wall on the far side okay, of that particular area. And then again, after crossing this 10-foot wall, there was a cattle track okay, where the leopard dropped the boy's body and then went down the hill. So now uh, there must be a question in your mind. Why did, after crossing so many barriers, why did the leopard drop the boy's body on this cattle track? Okay, because just when he had crossed the 10 foot wall and proceeded uh, for some distance down the cattle track, the sound of drums was heard from the village because by now the villagers they were aware that a boy had been killed by a leopard and the you know a crowd of villagers was proceeding towards this particular area and they were beating drums very loudly because it was believed that such a loud noise would uh, scare any uh, leopard scare away the leopard okay so they could not fight the leopard, but they were doing their bit. So they were beating the drums very loudly. And that actually scared the leopard. And he dropped the boy's body there. And he went down the hill because he wanted to fight. Okay. Then, why couldn't Corbett carry the body of the boy to the spot where the leopard had left it and wait for the animal there? So at first, when uh, Jim Corbett was told about the leopard's uh, trail, okay, he 
thought of bringing back. So probably what had happened, the villagers, they had reached that spot where the leopard had left the body of the boy uh, and they had carried the uh, boy's body back to the village and that is why the mother was mourning the death of her son. So when Jim Corbett heard about the leopard's trail, he first thought of taking the boy's body back to that spot and wait for the leopard there because he was sure that the leopard would come back uh, for his kill. Okay. But he could not do so. There were several reasons why he could not do so. Because in that particular area, a suitable spot was absent. The nearest tree was 300 yards away. So one yard is equal to three feet. Imagine, okay, 300 yards away. And it was leafless. So the nearest tree was a walnut tree and it was leafless. There were no leaves. So he could not possibly hide in that tree. And, you know, even if there were leaves, the tree was too far away from that spot. Then, the sun was about to set and there was not enough light for Corbett to construct a makeshift shelter for himself. So it was almost going to be dark and there was not enough time for him to construct any kind of shelter. Okay, where he could hide and then lie in wait for the leopard. And then sitting on the open ground was an option, but that was not a very good option because sitting on the ground would expose him to the sudden attack of the leopard. And in that case, he would not have time to use his gun. So these factors discouraged Corbett from carrying the body of the boy to the spot where the leopard had left it and waiting for the animal there. So he decided against this plan. So what did he do? There was another plan forming in his mind. He asked the headman of the village, the sarpanch of the village, for certain things. And you can see those things on screen. The first thing that he asked for was a crowbar. And you can see a crowbar uh, on the bottom left of the screen. Okay, something of this shape. All right. Then he asked for a strong wooden peg. You can see it on the top, right? Okay, a wooden peg. Then a hammer and a dog chain. All right, so these are the four things that he asked for. Now, what did he do with those four things? What was his plan? Now, on, sc on the screen, you can see what are called flagstones okay flagstones are flat stones which are used for flooring which are used to pave the floor okay so the courtyard was uh, you know shaped with flagstones there were flagstones like this uh, and uh, he had a plan in mind involving one of these flagstones so before doing anything uh, what did Jim Corbett do? He asked uh, the, you know, the women, actually uh, the mourning woman whose son had died and her daughter. There was also a daughter and both of them were crying. So he told the villagers to take away the women from that house, okay, to another house so that their wailing would not disturb the silence. He wanted the environment to be completely silent so that there would be possibility uh, for the leopard to return. All right. So first he had the mourning women removed from that particular house. Then what did he do? With the help of the crowbar, he prized off one of the flagstones. Prized off. It means what? Used force to separate the flagstone from the ground okay so you know his plan was to drive a wooden peg firmly into the ground so if you would not take out the flagstone you cannot drive a wooden peg through a stone 
right? So that is why he wanted to remove the flagstone so that there would be ground. And then after he removed the flagstone with the help of the crowbar, he hammered the wooden peg firmly into the ground. And one end of the dog chain was fastened to this wooden peg. So now one end was firmly, uh, you know, tied to this wooden peg. The other end of the chain, it was used to hold the dead body of the boy in place. Okay. Now, this was a setting. And then Jim Corbett, he had asked for a bundle of straw so that he could have, you know, something to hide behind and while he was keeping watch for the leopard. So he lay down on the veranda, partially hidden behind a bundle of straw. So now this was his plan that, you know, when the leopard would come back for the dead body of the boy and, uh, you know, he would move the dog chain. So even from the sound, uh, Jim Corbett would be warned and then he would be able to shoot the leopard. This was his plan. Then it was night. Okay. And the author was confident that the man-eater would return to the village that night. So why was he so confident? Jim Corbett was confident that the tiger, that the leopard, sorry, not tiger, that, that the leopard would return to the village. Okay. That's why he lay in wait for him. The leopard would surely come back to the spot where he had left his kill. You see, you know, he would, he would not tolerate it that he had to leave his victim behind and he could not enjoy the flesh of the boy. So definitely when uh, he would come back to that spot and would see that the dead body of the boy was not there, he would understand that the dead body would be in the village and he would come back for the dead body. Or else there was also another possibility even if, you know, the dead body of the boy could not be found, the leopard would come back for another kill to satisfy his uh, hunger for human flesh. And his previous attack had already shown him how easy it was to hunt in this particular village. So Jim Corbett was sure that the leopard would return to the village that day. How did Corbett's vigil begin? Vigil means the state of keeping watch. Okay. While he was waiting for the leopard, storm clouds gathered in the sky. At about 8 p.m., a heavy storm started, bringing lightning and thunder with it. Okay. So the, there were streaks of lightning and in that lightning, he could see the veranda. So he was Actually, you know, he was thankful that there was a storm and there was lightning because he thought in this light, even if a rat would cross the courtyard, he would be able to see the rat and shoot it. So if the leopard comes, he would definitely be able to see the leopard. But for an hour, nothing happened. After an hour, the rain stopped. However, the sky was still full of clouds. It was cloudy. Because of which the visibility was low. That means he could not see clearly the, the surroundings. Okay. Corbett was sure that the receding of the storm would encourage the leopard to come out of his den and look for his victim. So now he was sure that the rain had stopped, the storm had, uh, you know, gone away. So now this was... Uh, an opportune time for the leopard to come out of his den and look for his victim. Because you see, even the leopards, they are afraid of storms. So while the storm was going on, there was no chance of the leopard to come out of his place. But now that the rain had stopped, the leopard could come out and look for his victim. At that time, there was complete silence all around. 
even the women you know they had stopped crying because you see there is a there is a limit uh, to which you can cry even okay after that your emotions you know uh, they they somehow become balanced okay so now even the women had stopped crying so there was complete silence and corbett was sure that the dog chain and the dry straw the straw, uh, the straw was dry so the dog chain and dry straw would make noise when moved or stepped upon thereby warning him of the presence of the leopard so jim corbett was ready but then something happened that frightened corbett during his vigil suddenly he heard the noise made by the straw and before he could do anything he was aware of something furry creeping against his bare skin at the knee region he was actually wearing shorts so his knees were exposed bare skin okay so suddenly he could feel something furry brush against his knee and imagine his fright he was sure that it was the leopard then there was a pressure on his shoulder a pressure on his shoulder warned him that at any moment the leopard's claws would reach for his throat so he was sure that it was time for him to die and if he did not do something immediately you know death was waiting for him impending death impending death means something which is going to happen impending okay so impending death frightened him corbett readied his rifle immediately immediately he uh, you know positioned his rifle but before he could press the trigger a small kitten jumped down between his arms and his chest so it was not the leopard after all it was only a small kitten relieved corbett realized that the kitten had been caught in the storm and wanted to find a cozy place to settle for the night so imagine his fright and imagine his relief when he found out that it was only a kitten but that relief that sense of relief was not long lasting because immediately after uh, you know he had made this discovery he heard something else what was it corbett was just recovering from his fright when he heard growling some distance away gradually the growling grew louder and the author concluded that the sounds gave proof of a severe fight between two leopards he was sure that the man eater must have returned to the spot where he had left his kill and that spot must have been within the territory of a local leopard so this man eater was actually a trespasser this was not his area and still he had dared to hunt in this area so now what must have happened was that the local leopard and this man eater they must have come face to face usually leopards avoided such a fight so even if they came face to face they would judge each other's strength immediately a fight did not break out usually so they would judge each other's strength and the weaker one would back off okay so they did not want to kill each other so the weaker leopard uh, would you know back off all right but this time no one was ready to back off the local leopard also wanted to fight to protect his territory okay and the man eater though he was older he was more powerful than any other male leopard in this area so nobody was ready to step back so that is how this terrible fight between the two leopards broke out and jim corbett could only hear this fight going on he could not see anything because they were at a distance and he could only hear the growling but it, it he was such an expert hunter that from the growling he could tell what was happening okay a terrible fight broke out between the two leopards because the local leopard was also not ready to give up his territory to this 
stress pass up. Then, how many rounds did the leopards fight? The leopards fight lasted for four rounds before the noise of their fighting could no longer be heard by Corbett. What happened in the first round? It lasted for five minutes and it was inconclusive. Means Corbett could not tell which leopard was winning. Okay, because both the leopards, they fought with unabating savagery. Unabating means tireless. Nobody was getting tired. Both of them were fighting with equal might. Okay. Unabating savagery. Savagery means cruelty. So both the leopards, they fought with tireless cruelty. And that is why the first round was inconclusive. Then there was a gap of 10 to 15 minutes. There was silence for some time. And then the second round began. But now... From, you know, the level of noise that Corbett could hear, he could tell that the leopards had moved away further. They were two to three yards away from the first spot, the original spot where the fight had begun. A sign, and this was a sign, that the local leopard was able to drive back the intruder. So the local leopard, though he was less powerful than the man-eater, he was able to drive back the intruder, the trespasser. Then after some moments, there was a third round. And this third round, it was shorter than the first two rounds, but no less savage. Okay, so the fight was severe. Then there was a fourth round after a long silence. Probably they were getting a bit tired now, but they were not ready to give up. So there was a fourth round. The leopards had moved away further. When the fourth round began, Jim Corbett could tell that the leopards had moved further away, almost close to the hill. And then after a few minutes, the fight could not be heard anymore. So actually, Jim Corbett could not tell who won this fight because after the fourth round went on for some time, he could not hear the leopards anymore. They had moved away. So then Jim Corbett could only guess what could have happened. And there were, you know, more than one possibility. Okay. What were the possible results of the fight between the leopards? Corbett was sure that he would not be able to get a chance to shoot the Manita. So he had realized by now that his aim of coming to Bhanswara had been defeated. He could not do anything now. He could not shoot the Manita because the Manita was involved in a fight with the other leopard and he would not come to the village anymore. So Corbett was sure that his mission at Bhanswara had failed. Now he was thinking about the fate of the man-eater because he was concerned with the fate of the man-eater. There were different possibilities. One was that you know, the man-eater would win the fight. This was one possibility. Even if the man-eater won, he would be severely injured and would not be interested in hunting for some time. So he was not coming back to the village. Uh, you know, and obviously Jim Corbett could not wait there endlessly. He had to go back. Okay. Even if, and there was also another possibility. Even if the man-eater was injured after this fight, there was the possibility that his craving for human flesh would force him to haunt this area again. So there was also the possibility that, you know, after this fight, uh, his injuries would make him... Uh, you know, more cruel and he would uh, crave for human flesh and he would again come to this village to haunt. Because you see, if the man-eater managed to kill the local leopard, then this uh, territory would, would become his. Okay. But this would not happen soon. So, you know, Jim Corbett was concerned. What if I go away and then later I hear uh, that uh, the man-eater... Uh, you know, is alive and is attacking this village again. Okay, so that was his concern. 
the other possibility that the local leopard would win and the man eater would be killed so that would would actually give relief to the villagers of that area because this particular man eater had been tormenting the people of rudra prayag for 8 years now but it would also mean that neither the government or the corp, uh, or the hunter corbett okay would be able to take credit for saving the village from its threat so in this case the local leopard actually would be uh, given the credit of saving the villagers okay so all these thoughts were going on in the mind of jim corbett from whatever he could hear and after the some time he could not hear okay the, the fight of the leopard so these were the thoughts that went on in his mind so the result of the fight was unknown we had begun this uh, class with the question uh, if there was a fight between two leopards who won but actually the result of the fight was unknown as corbett could no more hear the growling after the fourth round so then there the essay ends okay the account ends for us in this extract okay but can you imagine the continuing fight in your imagination can you think what would have happened after the fourth round it's interesting to imagine this isn't it i hope you enjoyed the thrilling account by this hunter conservationist jim corbett thank you i stop here